today's topic or implantology and distraction osteogenesis mentor for the first topic implantology is dr vinay vijayakumar and mentor is dr rohit punga dr rohit punga is an alumnus from the prestigious ab shetty memorial institute of dental sciences he currently represents delhi ncr state to the national body of aomsi since 2019 He has been a been the vice president of the Delhi NCA state chapter of AOMSA from 2018 to 19, and orator of national repute has widely lectured across the country. He practices the full scope of maxillofacial surgery, ranging from distraction osteogenesis, orthognathic surgery, open surgery for TM joint, cleft surgeries, craniofacial trauma, and oral oncology. He has also attended various conferences and hands-on workshops on dental implants and advanced grafting procedures. including the global implantology week at the new york university usa in 2019 and soft tissue procedures workshops and full arch rehabilitation at latanda usa he has 20 publication to his credit and has moderated and chaired various sessions at conferences and workshops he recently recently conceptualized and moderated the first session on evidence based case discussions on condylar trauma conducted by delhi amsi for consultants academy academician and post graduates on 1st november 2020 he has been invited faculty for aomsi national conference in 2021 at mangalore 2022 at coimbatore aos aim of faculty in delhi in 2018 2021 and at aos aim of maxillofacial skills training program at aims new delhi in august 2022 his private practice is aesthetic facial surgery clinic gurgaon an exclusive specialty practice in oral maxillofacial surgery May I now request Dr. Rohit Punga to introduce the mentor and start the program? Thank you, Dr. Shashi Kela. That was a pretty elaborate introduction, and I have somebody where the introduction is going to go even more elaborate. It is my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Vinay Vijay Kumar. Uh, he is uh, not just MDS in oral and maxillofacial surgery. He holds Dr. Uh, Der Zahan Medicine from Germany. He holds FTS RCS from Edinburgh. He holds. Uh, DRH from Germany again, and MD and PhD in molecular mechanisms of regenerative processes from Rockstock Germany as well. Uh, the gentleman here is uh, also uh, holding private uh, practice licenses, practicing licenses in Germany and Sweden, along with in it in India. And he has a number of research publications. He's a, a prolific researcher, and his. Uh, Uh, academic positions and leadership positions include uh, being the AOCM of European faculty candidate since 2019, AOPR teaching faculty since 2019, examiner for MOMS uh, Royal College Edinburgh, and uh, he also is a ITI fellow since 2012, a registered ITI speaker since 2011, and the director of ITI Study Club Mang uh, Bangalore since 2011 to 2017, and again 2021 onwards. he uh, holds numerous scholarships numerous research awards and i think uh, we will for a short of time if i start going through his elaborate research work which is phenomenal and i hold his cv in my hands which lends around 9 pages and uh, dr vinay i i really uh, privileged to moderate you through this session uh, would you want to take the screen dr vinay yeah thank you dr rohit i yeah, i'm sorry for not making a average version i just send out a cv when asked uh no thank you for the very kind introduction uh thank the aomsi and especially T tamil nadu and uh, puducherry branch for this uh, ask your mentor session 4 uh dr sashikala thank you for coordinating and i will now share my screen this is this is new for me so share i realize that there are a set of questions that have been asked and i'm trying to give an answer we've got 30 minutes to discuss and i think the questions were all great and they are in fact a seminar on by themselves which can take about 45 minutes lecture of each of these questions so i think we'll try to condense it and what i what i thought is that um, i'll try and give as much evidence base as possible because i'm very strongly influenced i got a scholarship through the iti and i uh, and i think that that's one group in implantology which are the foremost not i think I, they are the foremost organization in research and education in implant dentistry and so i try to inculcate some of these iti philosophies which is basically based on evidence 
So the first question is, what are the strategies to avoid implant overloading? Uh, that, unfortunately, we don't have too much of randomized control trials or real evidence to back occlusal considerations in implant therapy. But most of the, the, the guidelines come from clinical recommendations. And I would like you all to please go through this article called Occlusal Considerations in Implant Therapy, Clinical Guideline with Biomechanical Rationale. It comes from the group of Homelay Wong and Carl Mish, uh, and it's published in Clinical Oral Implant Research. I have, uh, I have sent this article to, to, the, to the organizers uh, so that they would for sure share it with all the participants. When, when we talk about occlusal considerations, we need to know what's the difference between a tooth and an implant. Well, the tooth has got a periodontal ligament and the implant undergoes osseointegration or functional ankylosis, as said by Schroeder, and of course, osseointegration by Bronemark. Um, Andre Schroeder brought about the same concept, working independently about six to eight years later. Uh, there is a difference in proprioception between a tooth. Uh, the tactile sensitivity is different, and I'm not going to go through this whole, uh, whole chart uh, because of, we don't have the time to discuss it in detail, but this is there from that article. And when you look at the overloading factors, if you have an overextended cantilever, which is more than 15 millimeters in the mandible, which is more than 10 to 12 millimeters in the maxilla, and of course, these are studies which have come from uh, Bo Rangert and Shackleton et al. Uh, if patients have got parafunctional habits or heavy bite flosis, if there is an excessive premature contact, and this basically we have had a lot of monkey studies coming from the Japanese group, or more than 100 micrometers in human. And if there's a large occlusal stable, a steep cup, cusp inclination, or patients with poor density or quality of bone, and if we have inadequate number of implants loading the restoration, these are the causes of overloading factors. And when you look at occlusal guidelines, we can't put everything in one basket. Rather, we try to fix it, we try to break it down into different clinical situations. So if you have a full arched fixed prosthesis, the occlusal principle should be bilateral balanced occlusion with opposing complete denture. If the patient has got um, opposing natural dentition, then we try group function occlusion or naturally prot protected occlusion with shallow anterior guidance. We try not to provide any working uh, and balancing contacts on the cantilever uh, if there are any cantilevers. Infra-occlusion, slight infra-occlusion in the cantilever segment, freedom in centric so that the patient can move around and bite. Uh, if it's an overdenture, we try to provide a bilateral balanced occlusion ling uh, using lingualized occlusion, or you can use a monoplane occlusion on a severely resorbed bridge. Well, if you look at posterior fixed prosthesis, we try and give anterior guidance with the natural dentition if they are uh, present and uh, able to take the guidance or group function occlusion with compromised canines. We try to provide centered contacts, narrow occlusal tables, flat cusps so that there are no contacts when the patient is moving in eccentric and minimize cantilever. Uh, crossed by posterior occlusion, if and when necessary, so that we avoid a buccal cantilever or a lingual cantilever, depending on the arches. Uh, a natural tooth connection is only seen with a rigid uh, attachment. But nowadays, we don't go in for a natural tooth connection anymore because uh, later evidence has shown that that doesn't work so well. Uh, if you look at single implant prosthesis, anterior or lateral guidance with natural dentition, Light contact at heavy bite and no contact at light bite. We try to give centered contacts, no offset contacts, and increased proximal contact. Of course, if you have poor quality of bone or grafted bone, we wait for a longer healing time if required for the graft to take up. Now, mind you, if it's if you are using autogenous bone graft, if you wait for a much longer time, there's a higher resorption. So we try to do it between five months to six months for large grafting. Uh, say iliac crest grafting and so on. And we try at times a progressive loading by staging the diet and occlusal contacts. Uh, and that's something, again, these are clinical recommendations from expert clinicians, not necessarily that they have gone through the evidence-based protocol of dividing patients into different groups and asking them to have progressive diet versus groups which don't have progressive diet. So it's more of clinical recommendations in this.
This is a nice uh, flow chart that I got from the same article. And if you look at implant occlusion, and if you don't want to have overloading in this implant occlusion, first, we can increase the support area. And that means that trying and getting better bone quality, extending healing time or progressive loading, or you can increase the quantity of, 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 of the bone contact, such as implant number, implant diameter, the length and the implant surface in cases of extreme, um, to avoid occlusal overloading. We would like to improve force direction by changing the occlusal morphology. Instead of having you know, sharp cusps, we try to make it a flat central fossa, decrease the club cusp inclination, perhaps decrease the occlusal table so that it's centered around the implant. And now, I mean, it's very important that we are only talking about prosthetically driven implant placement. Okay, so that's like the fundamental of implantology, modern implantology right now. And so I'm, I'm not even stressing too much on that because we understand it's prosthetic driven implant dentistry. And we try to give the contacts along the implant axis and try to provide as much centered contacts as possible. If you want to reduce forced magnification, uh, we look at the position and distribution of the occlusal count taps. We decrease the uh, cantilever strength if required to avoid a cantilever, a buccal cantilever or a lingual cantilever, we could give cross bite, splinting of implants, and of course the positioning of implants. Right. Yeah. So I'll stop. I would just, stop it. Yeah. If, just if, if you no no no, fantastic, fantastically explained. I would just want to sum up for the audience because you've gone excellently elaborately into the fundamentals of uh, you know maintaining good implant occlusion and how not uh, how to prevent the overload. Uh, very valid points there, uh, saying that the cuspal inclination should be kept to as low as possible, narrow occlusal tables, basically all the things that we try to incorporate in our complete dentures to maintain a low uh, force, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bearing areas. So that's how we can reduce all that. And the lateral, uh, you know, the lateral forces will also reduce when you reduce these cuspal inclines. Uh, another important thing uh, that, yes, we are talking about prosthetically driven implants. In fact, we, now we are talking about aesthetic facially driven implants and not just prosthetically driven implants. So uh, you need to place the implant where the soft tissue support comes in well. And uh, of course, that should be secondarily prosthetically driven as well. So I think with the, that is that is the uh, important part for the audience to take home that uh, you need to maintain that the, uh, the crowns which are there uh, should always be supported well with uh, the, the implant should be treated as a root analog and not as a tooth analog. So you may have to actually place at times two thin implants for a single molar. Rather than thinking about extending the cantilevers, you should think about adding more implants as the base for your crowns there. I think we can go to the next one. Yeah, I mean, this, this question about occlusal considerations in implant therapy or how to uh, avoid implant overloading. That's a half a day topic, at least, you know, to try Absolutely. and talk Absolutely. about these concepts. And I don't know when I'm trying to do this rapid review, I don't know whether it goes ac across to the participants, but I strongly encourage you to read this article so that we get a good uh, yeah, idea of this. Yeah, thank you. I'll go to the next question. Endosseous versus basal implants, right? And see, there's no evidence for basal implants directly, okay? There's history of severe failures in the past, and hence it has been discontinued from Western Europe and US markets. It's not intended for widespread clinical use, definitely not in university practice in Western Europe. And perhaps the prevalence of basal implants is quite prevalent in those countries which are litigation free, where the consumer doesn't go to court and make sure that they can have a hold a, a, hold a practitioner to court in those kind of societies, it's rather prevalent. Why I tell you is that I have a license in working in the university. I've worked in universities in Sweden, in Germany as faculty, and this was hot topic and I would talk to them. And my prof told me as part of an ITI scholarship in the very beginning, he said, yes, we used to do, there used to be these kind of implants in the market before, but because there was so much of complications, nobody's even using it. And in a, in, a, in a conscious society like Germany or Sweden, they don't even go and because if you can even have your license withdrawn if you go ahead with certain certain amount of these practices. Well, what is a basal implant? Basal implant is a one-piece implant with a smooth polished surface 
It has got an aggressive thread design and it is cheap. It is low cost. It is placed in the cortical part of the bone and relies on mechanical stability or rather primary implant stability. Here again, we know through all these studies by Klaus Lang, by Danny Booza, by the ITI group, we very well know what is a primary implant stability and secondary implant stability. Secondary implant stability comes after osseointegration. Primary implant stability is mechanical stability. And we know that, that a bone is a living, living tissue. Bone is not dead. So there is going to be some amount of remodeling. And it is just some time before primary implant stability goes down and secondary implant stability comes in. When you don't think of osseointegration as a concept and only rely on mechanical stability, it is a matter of time before the whole thing comes out. Now, if you splint with multiple implants and there are 10 implants, then you need the 10th implant to get loose before the whole thing comes down. But for sure, someday or the other, the whole thing will come down. And when it does come down, it's a huge defect that is going to be formed. It's not something new. It has been there for a long time, from 1970s onwards. And it's not new that this, the, like a litigation true, very true, very true. societies bring about this topic. Yes. There have been tied, tested, and found, right? And I know fixation that, cannot osteofixation cannot uh, replace osteointegration, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then once you place it on, on, on the cortical part of bone, it is then immediately splinted to multiple other basal implants, generally for a full arch reconstruction. So I don't do this. This is some, this is the details that I've got from, from someone who does it. I have never done a basal implant. Uh, so I'm not like, I, I know that it's, when I asked for it, they said that it's not a viable uh, treatment option. Now it's a quick and it's a cheap method for treatment of otherwise complex problems. So when you have an extremely atrophic maxilla and mandible, it's a complex situation. It requires a lot of treatment planning. It requires a lot of expertise. It requires time to do it. But this becomes a quick, quick and cheap method. And hence, it sounds to be quite attractive. Why go through all the pain? Why to do <laughs> all of this? Let, if we can fix it like this, why not? And I think that's where the attractiveness comes in, right? Basal implantology began to be talked about and applied in practice in early 1970s, but it was discontinued in the early years. In 1990s, for sure, there were many litigations because of huge complications and lawsuits. So in regions where patient rights and litigations are common, there are practitioners who will not dare to go ahead and use this and end up with a failure, say, five years later or eight years later, because the cost of failure is tremendous. And, and that's that's my take on it. And that's what I know so far on that. And the comparison with, with basal implant with endosseous implant is that there is no osseointegration. Um, so it's a weak abutment and severely prone to peri-implantitis. Like I said, bone is living. A mechanical stability without osseointegration, I can't understand whether that principle works because whole of implant dentistry is based on osseointegration. It's a single piece implant. And so inclinations have to be corrected with bending pliers or filing intraorally. And I think this is a rather crude way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the mechanical properties of abutments. And in the era when we are talking about multi-unit abutments, when we are talking about angulated abutments, when we are, when we are talking about the implant abutment connection, uh, the MOS taper and, and so on, and talking so much about that design, when you 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 just encompass all of that and say not of, none of that is important, let's just go and simply file it or cut it inside the mouth. I think it's rather crude. True, rather crude. Taking an impression of a single piece basal implant is easy and fast, and that's why it's attractive for someone. You don't need all that skills. You don't need all that uh, extra paraphernalia. But and all impressions are at the abutment level. And we know that for a full complex, full arch reconstruction, we need ideally implants, uh, impressions at the implant level for getting a good emergence profile. We don't need impressions at the abutment level, rather we need it at the implant level. Then it uses large cement retained restorations. And we know large cement retained restorations have their own disadvantages. The gold standard is crew retained restorations for retrievability, for cleanliness, for long-term stability. And that is clear in, in, in literature. All literature. Yeah, almost, yes, exactly. 
Retrievability is destructive. If you have this, I have had patients come back to me with basal implants with one or two with pus, pus coming out and large bone destruction, but trying to retrieve that whole prosthesis, it's a nightmare. It's cutting down a lot. It's a lot of heat that is generated. It's a messy affair. It's a painful affair. And trying to remove some of those implants inside are, it's completely destructive. I've read case reports of real big, uh, you know, leading to similar like resection defects using this. We cannot incorporate uh, basal implants into digital workflows because they're, they're, uh, their progress of science is not trying to get digital, but rather try and make it as simple as possible or as, as less complicated as possible. Due to poor mechanic strength of one basal implant, it is necessary to place a large number of them. And then that is again another question, why do you need to place so many implants and so on? You know, they are cheap, of course. The, the implants are cheap because there's no surface treatment required. It's just mechanic, uh, mechanical polishing. There are lesser components, so lesser inventory, lesser machinery, because I think at one point of time, someone who does basal implants even told me that you don't even need a physio dispenser. You can use it with a micromotor. I'm not too sure whether that is true, but this is one of the proponents who had said that. Uh, so there's lesser machinery. So of course, the attractiveness lies in that you just need a small, you know, without much inventory. But at the same point, of, at the, but we are all, they're all, we, we do science, we do patient, uh, uh, patient centric treatment approach, and there's hardly any evidence uh, to support this kind of treatment today. We don't know how it is about 10 years, but I don't know whether this, with this kind of present kind of system of how it is, I don't think this will last for too long in a litigation conscious society. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, we've had uh, certain uh, you know colleagues who faced litigation with uh, all these basal implants up here as well. So uh, I'm sh I'm sure as people get to know more, these things will be out of the market soon. Otherwise, you never know. But there's no there's no evidence, as you very rightly said, to support all these uh, uh, basal implantology uh, science. And it, it's as simple. You know, we start loading implants in the second, third, fourth months, depending on the different designs that are made. And all of them are basically relying more on the, uh, you know, the secondary stability. It is, it is in classical science, primary stability concepts have been discarded. You can actually place, uh, I mean, in fact, I have myself placed implants with zero uh, primary stability and they have come out fantastically well over five years and stuff. So I don't think there is any reason for us to believe that, you know, osseointegration is a science that can be discarded and replaced by something like a quick fix solution, like a basal implant. So no evidence, not recommended. Oh, please, I think we can go to the next one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. So next is about uh, zygomatic implants, indications, contraindications, and technique, right? So zygomatic implants rely on this concept of remote anchorage, where you take stability from the cortical bone, of course, of this region at the zygomatic arch. Um, they've been around for a long time, 1997 97 onwards. In fact, I would like you all, I've also sent one article in this. The ITI recently had a consensus conference in 2023, a few months back, uh, where they looked at it and then they saw that there's a really large amount of evidence for the use of zygomatic implants. And finally, after all these years of really good documentation, we get clinical guidelines out of it. And that's the first consensus conference we have had on the use of zygomatic implants. So imagine a concept such so well described like a zygomatic implant. It took all these years for us to rather come into mainstream implant dentistry because the evidence was lacking till this time. And that's about evidence-based implant dentistry. It's not about doing something uh, quick or, or, or things like that, but rather following signs. So the indications for zygomatic implants, of course, extremely atrophic maxilla, but it's not the first, not currently it is not considered as the first line of treatment, often as a last line of treatment. You can use it as congenite in congenital defects such as ectodermal dysplasia, papillon Lefebvre syndrome, cleft lip and palate patients. You can have large traumatic or acquired defects of the maxilla. Patients with low level maxillectomy, say a Brown's class two classification where the zygomas are intact, the orbital flows are intact, a quad zygoma is a very good option. Uh, 
Of course, in patients who cannot wait and cannot undergo grafting and they need an early function, this is one of those indications for zygomatic implants. Well, contraindications, first and foremost, I would like to say that it's a complex procedure. So skills are required. We need to have adequate zygomatic bone volume. And if there is an absence of that, then it is contraindicated. If patients have got infections, sinusitis, or an active pathology in that region, in the maxillary sinus zygomatic um, uh, bone complex, better not to do it. And it's often as a last stage procedure if grafting does not work. So conventionally, till now, till about mid 2000s, it was about as a second stage procedure. Now more and more people are doing uh, science and really enrolling patients. Ruben Davo's group is one example of that. Apracho's group is another example of that, where they enroll patients as part of a trial and then, and then say that, okay, maybe we might not need to consider it as a last stage, but maybe much more earlier in the treatment uh, as an indication. Well, uh, techniques, you have the original surgical technique by Bronema, where they, you have a window in the maxillary antrum on the lateral surface of the maxilla. And often Bronema says that you can push the sinus membrane inside instead of perforating it, but make a large window so that you can adequately visualize a zygomatic implant going in. Then Stella and Warner in 2000 said that hey, you don't need to make such a large window. You can make a smaller window knowing the trajectory and then you make a sinus slot and then push the window inside so that you can see the procedure. Then you had uh, patients uh, from the Marlow group saying that you can even use an extra sinus technique. Uh, you don't need to go inside through the sinus and you can perhaps avoid maxillary sinusitis by using an extra sinus technique. Well, I'm not very convinced of the, about the total extra sinus technique, and nor are many uh, clinicians who I know who talk about the total extra sinus technique in cases of an resorb bridge. In maxillectomy, of course, you don't have any other choice. You have to have that cantilever falling in. But in cases with the resorb bridge, I'm rather skeptical of leaving the whole part extra sinus. Then you have cord zygoma approach where you don't have enough of place for the anterior implants by uh, described by Ruben Davo at all. And then you have a zago approach. Now, I would like to tell you that the zago zygomatic anatomy guided approach, that's not a surgical technique, but it is an anatomic classification, which just tells us where the implant has to come out. The idea is to get the implant out in the ideal prosthetic three-dimensional situation, prosthetically driven implant dentistry, prosthetically driven zygomatic implant placement. But because of the anatomy, you have Zaga 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And not that it's a, it's a surgical technique, but rather it's an anatomical classification. And this, that's the picture of Zaga 1 to 5. I've sent you the, the, the paper uh, written by Pear Camera, a camera with all these names on it. You know, you have uh, Carlos Apracho, you've got uh, Ruben Davo, you have got uh, Chantal Malavez, I think. You've got all the all the guys, uh, Sefin um, uh, Zephyr, uh, Bilal al uh, Edmund Bedrosian. So all these guys are there on that paper in the recently concluded Zygomatic Implant Conference paper. And I've sent that on this uh, group, so you will be able to read it. Um, and that's the, these are pictures from that. At the bottom, you can see the sinus slot technique or rather original surgical technique where you make a window to see the implant placement. And the others is the Zaga concept. Dr. Rohit. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I totally agree with you when you say that uh, in, uh, I mean, the Zaga 4 and the Zaga 3 are more prevalent when you're doing something like maxillectomy defects or what we recently did in mucormycosis. But uh, in cases of, uh, you know, when we have severely atrophic uh, maxillas, uh, well, uh, I, I in fact have a question for you, Doctor. When I, whether uh, when we are placing it in atrophic uh, maxillas, uh, when we are doing an extra, you know, extra sinus uh, placement, the crestal part does still stick on to the uh, alveolar process. So basically, it's just the polished surface which is extra uh, sinus. So uh, why do you feel that it is a little uncomfortable to do a Zaga 3 or a Zaga 4 in a, a atrophic maxilla, as you said? Yeah, yeah, very good question. In fact, thanks for that question so that I can uh, clarify this. Please. Well, Zaga 3 is not a problem. 
Okay, but Zaga 4, for example, when it is completely extra sinus, if you look at the biomechanics of, of uh, implant placement, and in fact, I was just going through the literature and there was something recent. I forgot the name of the person. I don't know if it is Thomas or something, but it came out of India, in fact. It came out of uh, some institution in Chandigarh, PGI, not PGI, sorry, some part in, uh, not Chandigarh, um, Christian, Christian College. Um, TMC Ludhiana, maybe. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. I was going through that. It's come out through that. I think it's from the Prosto division where they also confirm that if you look at the biomechanics, the main stress distribution is not over here. The main stress distribution is at, at the crest. Yeah. So you need to have some amount of bone at the crest contact so that the stress is distributed in that region. Hmm. Somehow we tend to think that when we are using a zygomatic implant, the anchorage comes from the cortical bone, yes. But when you look at the stress distribution, the stress distribution is at the alveolus. It is the main stress distribution is not over here. So majority of the stress should be supported at the alveolus. And at the same time, we I would like I'm quoting Ed Bedrosian. He says that we are not looking at a case like an ideal central incisor in a 25 year old uh, patient with a high lip line. We are talking about a completely different characteristics of patients who are edentulous, who are crippled, and they need tooth function. You cannot compare it in such a way that, okay, I will get it, you know, exactly this way. We have to perhaps compromise a little bit thinking of longevity of the implant, Absolutely. thinking of how long the implant stays. And most studies have shown longevity is better if you have some form of contact at the alveolar crest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Two-point cortical contact is important to, for the stability. That is the bottom line. And yeah. wherever it is possible, we should try to give it. And wherever it is not possible, we should think about cross heart stabilization in a quad zygoma for maxillectomy defects. Yeah, I, I, like, I exactly. think that, that would be yeah. exactly in a maxillectomy. You can't do anything. Yeah, you can't do anything about the alveolar what, part. What is your experience with unilateral defects of the, uh, you know, in mucormycosis? We did a lot of unilateral zygoma with one pterygoid and one nasal basal implant and, you know, trying to get a plane out of the three. Uh, but uh, anyways, I would not comment. I would want the mentor to tell us that what, what is his experience on these kind of situations when we don't get cross heart stabilization, but yeah. you know, just have unilateral uh, thing. I, I was personally not very happy doing it. We did it for a couple of cases and then I discontinued doing it. In fact, yeah, luckily, yeah. Mucor mucormycosis is no longer there. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you for this thing. question. My experience with mucormycosis is completely limited because I don't have any cases uh, done during this COVID time because I was in Sweden at that time and there were zero cases of mucor. There were zero cases reported in Europe with mucor-assisted maxilla, maxilla destruction. So my, my uh, experience is rather limited in this case. But I've had cases for maxillectomy defects following tumor. Yeah. And I've had about 44 patients, I'm writing that, I had written that paper and submitted it. You know, the sad part of it is because of the disease factor, we can't have, I couldn't have long-term outcomes in patients with malignancies because in those patients in whom I had placed zygomatic implants, they didn't survive for five years. So those patients who I did in zygomatic implants, they were second stage, secondary, if they can't get a free flap which meant that they had either aggressive diseases, they had uh, bad systemic conditions or something which does not allow us to go ahead and place a free flap. Because at that point of time, it was about 2011, 2014. That's my time period that I was doing the study. And unfortunately, because of the disease, none of these patients survived more than five years. So we can't have five-year outcomes of that. But I know that the zygomas are there. Many of them weren't even rehabilitated because after that we went and gave in radiation. So the mouth opening was decreased. They had other issues coming up. So if I were to give you my true, true picture of it, we had placed in a la large amount, but in these onco patients, we don't know their survival for five years, to be honest. I and I do research. So I call, pick up my phone, I call them up, I I speak to their relatives, I ask them, please come for follow-up because that's my uh, research. And I have not been able to get that. And when you place these implants in resection defects, do you prefer to place them during the time of resection itself? Yes. So that there is some yes. better, uh, you know, you know. I think that would be an important take-home point for the postgraduates who are listening to us, that, uh, you know, it's better to place them so that you have all the advantages of osseointegration integration taken up soon rather than place it in an irradiated bone later on, which, which would be counterproductive, in fact. 
Absolutely. In fact, I had one case recently which I did, and it was in an irradiated bone, waited for one year, saying that we'll wait one year post irradiation. But still, the patient's bone quality was quite poor, uh, and she had other complications. The implant was placed in the correct position, no problem with that. But then, because of the bone healing problems and other issues, um, at the end, you look at the patient satisfaction. And if you're not able to give that to the patient, then you have not succeeded, actually, in doing your treatment. I think I think that's a good discussion for zygomatic. Maybe if you want, want to take to the next one. We can okay. go to the next thing. Maybe. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know how much time we have. Are we... Yeah, we are doing well, I think. We have yeah. another 10 minutes, I think. Yeah. Okay. So management of peri-implantitis, this is rather straightforward. It's been talked about in a long for a long period of time. And it's a CIST protocol. I would I have again put in one paper by um, um yeah, I know her so well, but now the name doesn't come. Uh, anyway, okay. I've, I've put in her paper. Uh, I've, I've, she's the editor of COIR, Lisa Heights Mayfield. How can I even forget? So I've put in a paper by Lisa Heights Mayfield over there where she's done a really good systematic review. And then the, the protocol is CIST protocol. That is Cumulative Interceptive Supportive Therapy Protocol. First thing we have to do, mechanical debridement. There are various to do, ways to do it. Titanium brush. Uh, some people say laser, some people uh, use uh, uh, some other kind of uh, curates, which are not metal curates. Uh, I have them myself. So we, there are different types of mechanical debridement methods. One is not shown to be superior over another. There is no clear cut uh, saying that one is better than the other. Right now, there's a technique called as Galvo Surge, which was introduced by Nobel. And then I think now taken over by Strauman also. And that's supposed to be good, but we don't have long-term data on that. It's just some new product which has come into the market, uh, in the Western market. I don't think it's available in India as of now. Second aspect is antiseptic treatment. And then you can use a lo lot of local antiseptic agents. Some people use tetracycline uh, solutions, uh, chlorhexidine solutions, uh, so on and so forth. Again, we don't have superiority of one agent over the other. Systemic antibiotic treatment is often necessary when you've got large-scale peri-implantitis. The role of antibiotic systemic treatment is also not really conclusive, but this is a protocol that has been formed. And at the end, of course, you can either do regenerative or resective therapy, surgery. Resective surgery means that you do an implantoplasty and try to smoothen the implant surface. So remove the rough surface and try to make it as smooth as possible. You do regenerative by doing guided bone regeneration, or soft tissue graft, connective tissue grafts to plump up the soft tissue in that region. And they have shown to have certain amount of success. So basically, this is the protocol for uh, peri management of peri-implantitis. Dr. Rohit, your take, please. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, you know, we were at the University of uh, New York and they were discussing a lot about these uh, peri-implantitis things. And what they recommended was that the combination of uh, you know, tetracycline with chlorhexidine, 2%, 0.2% uh, chlorhexidine, along with uh, hydrogen peroxide to some extent can be used for surface treatment when you have peri-implantitis. So that gives it a, you know, it's an antibiotic treatment as well as some, uh, you know, all the, uh, there's, there's no slimy surface remaining back. It's kind of an edge surface back to what best you can have in a peri-implantitis case. And then you think about your reattachments of the soft tissue to that later. So yeah. that, that, that is what they recommended there. And that is all that I have to share as far as the uh, evidence is concerned. Yeah. I mean, I've put in now in this also the ITI consensus conference on peri-implantitis and their consensus statement with all leading experts who have also gone through uh, evidence-based uh, literature review. And I've said, I've, I've put it along with this. So everybody would get a copy of that. Okay. Next question. I'll go on. Yeah. Please, please. Yeah. Okay, complications of endoscious implants. Now, technically, complications of endoscious implants means that you've done the implants right, and then you end up with a complication. So when we are putting implants in non-ideal positions, when we are trying to overload the implants, I don't consider it as a complication, but rather a iotrogenic problem. When you look at complications of endoscious implants, they are rather simple. You can have biological complications or a peri-implant disease which can be divided into mucositis, peri-implantitis, soft tissue complications, and allergic reactions, which is really very, very rare, but I just put it just to make it comprehensive. And you can have technical complications such as implant-related, where you have fracture of the implant. 
uh, you have connection related technical complications such as loosening or the fracture of the abutment. These are rather kind of common. Or suprastructure related where you have framework fracture, uh, fracture of the veneering surface. You can have loss of retention or fracture of the cement seal depending on a cement retain restoration. And these are the technical complications. Uh, I don't think we need to go more in detail uh, regarding that. Uh, Dr. Rohit, what do you I, I think I think these are the more important complications. And all that I can say is that, you know, uh, usually the patient in the first counseling itself, when he comes to the preoperative counseling, you must, I mean, uh, uh, usually that's what I do. And I'll just share my experience here that we tell the patient that, you know, it's like buying a car. You need to get it serviced regularly because it's not infrequent to see patients who will walk into your clinic after four years, suddenly after the implant, because four years, nothing happened in four years, they come up with a problem. And this problem now has, you know, it's, it's led to more than the 0.2 mm annual bone loss. It's led to more uh, peri-implantitis. And all those things can be taken care of if we do the regular servicing of the, you know, you can remove the screws. You can just have a nice uh, uh, a, a kind of a good hygiene maintenance of the substructure uh, in maybe once a year or so. So that is a good advice to the patients to prevent peri-implantitis in a severe stage wherein you may have to draw a sorry figure out the patient may have to lose the implants later. So a regular follow-up of all these patients. So that's what I tell them. It's, it's like buying a car, you got to get service regularly. So that, that keeps it simple sometimes. Yeah, perfect. I, 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 we cannot um, stress more on regular follow-up and maintenance protocol. I mean, that's really important. Absolutely. Okay, contraindications of endosseous implants. And when you look at it, you have absolute and relative contraindications. Absolute contraindication means definitely you are not going to do it at all. And relative contraindication means, okay, go ahead and uh, think about it before you control. So ASA class five and six, I'm, I hope all the participants are aware of American Society of Anesthesiology's classification, where class five is basically a moribund patient where a patient is going to die uh, unless you perform this procedure. And there is no patient where you have to place an implant for the patient to live. So definitely a ASA class five is one of them. Class six is a patient who's, main, who's kept on an artificial respirator for organ donation. And of course, you don't need to place implants in these kind of patients. Patients with high dose irradiation, uh, patients with high dose intravenous bisphosphonates, patients on multimodal chemotherapy, immunosuppressive agents, patients who have got a proven allergy to implant material, and patients have got a total lack of compliance who don't even understand what you're going to do with uh, do while placing these implants. Now, these are the absolute contraindications. When you look at relative contraindications, you've got ASA type 2, type 3, and type 4. Type 2 is a mild disease that is well-controlled. Type 3 is a moderate disease under control. Uh, and type 4 is a, is a really uh, severe kind of disease which is under control. They can be relative contraindications. Diabetic patients, we have to check control. I'm, I'm doing a randomized control trial on diabetic patients with implants, and I think that it's going to show some really good results. Patients on long-term low dose or oral bisphosphonates, it's a relative contraindications and not an absolute. Patients on low dose immunosuppressives, patients on corticosteroids because their uh, host response is rather uh, limited. Patients with after thromboembolic events, you try to postpone six months following that. Drug allergies, avoid the drugs that they are allergic to. Patients who are smoking more than 10 cigarettes a day, that's a relative contraindication. And patients with insufficient oral hygiene and their uh, relative contraindications. So when you look at contraindications for endosseous implants, this is what um, I have a list of. Yeah, Dr. Rohit? Uh, well, uh, I have a little uh, new things to add here. Like, you know, okay. uh, have you used the trabecular mesh technology these uh, uh, Zimmer people have got this now. So, uh, I mean, we, I have procured a couple of them. I've placed a few implants, not long enough to have a long-term follow-up, but I think in a couple of years, we'll be able to share them, especially in uh, severe diabetics and uh, oral bisphosphonate patients. So uh, the, 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 uh, the R&D claims that, you know, these, uh, because of the trabecular mesh, they have uh, a structure which will uh, probably hold the bone for a longer time and the osseointegration will be better. And this is not a new technology because it's already there in orthopedics. So I am relying on the uh, articles that they presented and uh, probably some of these complications can over time go off the list maybe later on. But as of now, of course, for all regular 
uh, endosseous implants without any meshes or any screw vents i think we 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 will maintain the uh, all for all examination purposes and for all viva answers i think this is absolutely perfect but yeah. uh, yes there, there is more more uh, i mean because it's already there it's a proven thing so uh, it's just that we have not done enough studies ourselves to um, you know yeah uh, yeah i i agree I, I, I when they had this trabecular implant design the, the center where i was doing my scholarship i was that center was part so i was filling in some forms uh, i why i completely agree that there are new designs that are going to come say for example if you have narrow diameter implants you can avoid augmentation in most of these patients you can have a better wound healing but these are all not yet in spite of all of this all these conditions still stay as a relative contraindication we have certainly, to be wary certainly. of these yes, conditions yes, absolutely 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 and, and for sure science is going to find newer methods of treatment and all of that till that time we have to be absolutely wary of these kind of patients and that absolutely 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 okay absolutely. thank you so i go to the next pterygoid implants indications contraindications and techniques so i'm not a person who have who has used pterygoid implants because uh, i don't uh, do them because i've still now i've not found a need to do pterygoid implants i've done zygomatic implants my main thing is sinus floor elevation i mean there is no other procedure which is as predictable as sinus floor elevations in the posterior maxilla it has Absolutely. got a long proven history multiple groups doing it all around the world 30 year data so there's nothing which is you know the bread and butter and safe in the posterior maxilla according to me as compared to a, a a sinus floor elevation and so that's always my go to technique and i have not yet had the need to not to find something where it doesn't work i've got if they don't work i've gone ahead and placed zygomatic implants but to be honest i have not done too much on this so maybe i might not be the right person to talk on it but anyway i i, I read a little bit for this so pterygoid implants can be pterygoid or they can be called as pterygo maxillary or tuberosity implants the definition of uh, glossary of maxillofacial implantology is that implant placement through the maxillary tuberosity and into the pterygoid plate um, they have been mainly studied in partial edentulism as a treatment alternative to sinus lift procedure and as a faster treatment alternative the cumulative survival rate over a 10 year period is largely due to the data from one study and that was 91% but that was only one study that we have the whole literature has got one study of a 10 years procedure so evidence for long term implant success and survival is weak in the current literature furthermore there's only limited evidence on immediate function and pterygoid implants and this is a nice article by bidra uh, in 2011 i i i presume that he's an indian who's gone and uh, settled in the us and uh, has done and this paper is really nice and i've i've kept this paper so that all of you can read it and i think uh, most most papers that talk on pterygoid implants quote this article uh, so definitely it's an important article and there they say that there's complete there's limited evidence of the use limited long term uh, reports except for one study and so the pterygoid implant is placed in the region of the former first or second maxillary molars and it follows a diagonal direction posteriorly towards a pyramidal process and the implant ultimately anchors in the pterygoid fossa of the sphenoid bone and the angulation of the pterygoid implants ranges from 45 to 50 degrees towards the maxillary plane uh yeah that's this is what yeah. i've taken out of uh, of one of those websites and not that i have my own personal experience because i haven't found the need to do pterygoid implants Uh, I I I concur with you on this. The the need for doing pterygoid implants is very very selective. In fact, the cases where I was talking about the you know the hemi maxillary or or the uh, I mean the unilateral maxillary resections in those cases to get a three point uh, stabilization, you can place a pterygoid implant along with a single zygoma because in these cases sometimes it becomes difficult with uh, you know the zygoma body being so small that you cannot place two zygomas. So you need to place one zygoma there. you place one floor one in the nasal floor and then you need use one of your pterygoid implants otherwise absolutely there is nothing which replaces a direct sinus lift like anything else there there is there is no uh, there is no need apart from sometimes i feel in the indian scenario university setups 
cost is a consideration wherein the grafts and the membranes because you sometimes need to sandwich the grafts and place a membrane so the cost of those two grafts and one membrane uh, boils down to the cost of your entire implant here so after that if you're not doing a sa3 kind of a thing you're asking the patient to come back so i think convenience is the reason why people want to go towards steroid implant and for all those who want to go into steroid implant if you are not an orthognathic surgeon you are not scared of the descending palatine but all those who have done uh, terigo maxillary disjunctions in classical orthognathic surgery should be scared of hitting the vessels back there in the terigoid implant placement and that is a very very significant thing which people who are doing orthognathic would understand so that that's that's my fear of not doing terigoid too much and i just reserve it for situations wherein you have absolutely nothing else left so that that's that's where i concur with you completely okay thanks dr rohit thanks now i think is the last question complications of sinus floor elevation you can have sinus membrane perforation poor primary implant stability bleeding from the injured vessels and implant migration sinus membrane perforation is the most frequent complication it may not be detected intraoperatively so minor perforations uh, they don't reduce implant survival if handled properly so I, we tend to put a barrier membrane in between the perforation and the and the uh, the graft material large perforations more than 10 mm they may reduce implant survival so in those cases it's better that we postpone the surgical procedure and come back at a later date uh, we use a barrier membrane to seal off the perforation if yeah. you have poor primary stability we use a two stage imp implant placement so graft first wait and then come back and place an implant you can use condensing osteotomes in the uh, or you know like you have bone condensing uh, burrs right now uh, you can use a, a, a smaller osteotomy and a larger implant you could use a tapered implant or an implant with an active thread design all of these are the possibilities to overcome poor primary implant stability uh, bleeding from injured vessel is not too much of a clinical problem you can almost always get a hemostatic agent be patient and you'll be able to take care of it and of course, if the implants migrate into the sinus, we have to do a Cadwell luck and take out the implants. Most likely, these would be your referral cases and not something that you would do by yourself. Uh, because if you follow these protocols, you might not have uh, implants displaced into the sinus. But it may occur in case of low bone density and res reduce residual bone height. Please take a CBCT or a, a medical CT to evaluate the bone conditions before we go ahead and place an a, a sinus floor or an implant. And a displaced implant should be removed and cannot be let to stay over there to avoid chronic sinusitis. And of course, you can have an oroantral communication or an oroantral fistula if the implant is removed, and then you manage it like how you manage an oroantral communication. The complication rates are quite, I mean, there are a lot of complications that have been said, but in spite of that, this is much safer, a much more predictable procedure than the other kind of alternatives that you have currently. Uh, and if you master sinus, you need to master sinus floor elevation before you go ahead and do the pterygoids or the zygomatic implants, because this forms the basic, uh, yeah, the basic step in managing a posterior maxilla. Absolutely. Yeah. And with that, uh, Dr. Rohit, I would like to thank you for, for this. And I'd like to thank the whole committee. And I hope I've not extended too much. Not really. Not really. I, I, I will extend it too much. I don't know whether uh, we are being watched, but uh, I do need to push in here one very significant point, which uh, would be the probably the closing comment from my end that yes, direct sinus lift is one of the most versatile procedures to manage the posterior maxilla. But I think a very simple way to avoid, you know, things like implant migration and all just to follow Mish. When he says SA3, do SA3. When he says SA4, do SA4. So if you have 4 or 5 mm of bone, only then go ahead and place the implant simultaneously. Otherwise, preferably delay the uh, uh, you know, implant placement. So that will keep it safe because you will get some primary stability. And meanwhile, the bone will form later on. So the chances of implant migration post uh, placement into the sinus flow become less if we are able to follow that simple dictum of 4 to 5 mm of residual uh, you know, sinus flow remaining to give us primary stability. That's what I personally uh, have always read, preached and followed. So that keeps us relatively safe in the safe uh, zone. Uh, also, sometimes we can use, uh, in fact, we, I have, I don't know, uh, she will not let me do it, I'm sure. But I have uh, certain cases wherein, uh, you know, I can actually, uh, we, we, we've had, okay, this is right there on the screen. So 
yeah this is this is one of the cases wherein we had a uh, you know we had a sinus perforation during the procedure and if you see there are two blocks which are placed which uh, of course need a kind of a buccal fat pad coverage later on but this is exactly the best photograph i have from that case so there therein you can actually place the uh, you know another membrane to cover up the uh, sinus perforation then you pack in your graft to raise the membrane and on top of that when you have that chunk of bone which you remove from the posterior maxilla can be used as a cortical graft for a horizontal augmentation along with that of course a rocky mountain small block has been used but these are these are ways in which we can actually you know augment a lot of posterior maxilla uh, for for the patient wherever required so even that small piece of uh, uh, bone which is usually we preserve it and we take it up uh, in the routine fashion that actually can be sometimes harvested to be used as a this thing so this is one of the uh, situations wherein this was done so uh, i think i think uh, and fantastically covered all the aspects uh, dr vinay uh, it was lovely listening to all the research and how you can easily cite the research so easily with every slide so it was a phenomenal thing listening to you thank you so much uh, dr shashikala you are i hope yes, we have sir. not taken a lot of time from you uh, thank you sir it's very good yes sir uh, with this uh, thank you thank you all with this we come to the end of the implantology session on behalf of tamil nadu able message we would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the mentor dr vijay vinay vijay kumar and moderator dr rohit punga for their valuable contribution and sharing the knowledge thank you very much sir for the excellent session thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you so much thank you we move on to the next topic the mentor of the next topic distraction osteogenesis is dr shishmita rajmogan and moderator for the next talk uh, distraction osteogenesis is dr thomas zakaria dr thomas is graduated from college of dental surgery manipal and mds from ab shetty memorial institute of dental sciences mangalore he worked as an assistant professor in the department of oral maxillofacial surgery at the manipal college of dental sciences mangalore till 2018 till 2008 before proceeding for a one year surgical fellowship program at the meenakshi cleft and craniofacial center meenakshi amal dental college he has continued since 2009 as a faculty in the department of omfs meenakshi amal dental college and hospital where he is presently working as professor apart from publications presentations and guest lectures to his credit he has also contributed chapters to the textbook of oral oral medicine and radiology he won best delegate paper award at the tamil nadu msi state conference held at erka february 2018 he had received research contribution award for 2020 and 21 but by meenakshi university and faculty academic excellence award by meenakshi amal dental college and hospital in 2022 He is a recognized PG PhD guide by Meenakshi University. He holds two patents, one for the modified lingual flap retractor and another for sagittal split ramus osteotomy and another for maxillary intraoral retractor. His fields of interest include orthognathic surgery, TMJ surgery, secondary deformity correction, reconstructive surgery and rhinoplasty. May I now request Dr. Thomas to introduce the mentor and start the program. Uh, dr thomas am i audible i think dr thomas have some net connection net issues no yeah, audible ma'am okay hello okay i will introduce dr shishmita ma'am yes i think we'll continue with the questions. we'll continue ma'am we will continue ma'am you can just put across the question and ma'am your I volume is your volume is very low Ah, uh, Shashmita, ma'am, your volume is very low. Okay, hold on, one minute, one. Minute. Yes, ma'am, I'll call up uh, Doctor Thomas. Till then, uh, you can. Yeah, I will continue. Yeah, thanks, Kalpa. Yeah, I think uh, is it better now? Is it better now? It is. It is slightly better, ma'am. If you increase some more, it is better, ma'am. Yeah, it is better now. Ah, uh, it is better, ma'am. so i think uh, maybe you will uh, just i will uh, share ma'am yes i will share yes ma'am yeah and we'll continue one after the other yes and i think since uh, i i will i will introduce you first ma'am then i will share the screen no worries share the ppt yes yeah. yeah 
Dr. Shushmita Rajmohan is a professor in the Department of OMFS, Sri Aurobindo College of Dentistry, Indore. BDS from Davangri 2000 in the year 2000 and MDS from Babuji Den College of De Babuji Dental College, Davangri 2003. And she has done surgical fellowship in cleft and craniofacial surgery and also fellowship in aesthetic medicine. And she got, she got the fellowship from FIBOMFS, that means uh, the IBOMFS and PGDHA and got special training in oculoplastic surgeries and her areas of interest and practice are trauma, cleft, rhinoplasty, TMJ surgeries, facial aesthetics, non-surgical and surgical. And have published a modification of trauma lip repair technique in Bijoms. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for accepting the invitation. I will share the screen now. Ma'am, Thomas sir has joined, ma'am. I think, sir. Join? Okay. Dr. Thomas, can you share your screen? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Dr. Thomas. Yes, please. Can you share the uh, screen, Dr. Thomas? I'm doing. Doing okay. Is the screen visible? Uh, not it. Not it. Yeah, it is just. It's just. Give me a, so okay. my apologies. It's your apologies. Uh, we're having some technical issues here. No, you're just on time. I'm uh, just sharing it. I don't know for some reason. Uh, I got logged out and uh, the system was not. Uh, I'm not able to. But it's sharing now actually. Shashikala, can you share the screen meanwhile? Is it? Uh, yeah, it is coming. Actually, it is coming. It is showing us screen sharing. It is. Is it visible now? It is. It is coming as has started screen sharing. Okay. Okay. My apologies uh, for this uh, delay here. No problem, sir. We wait for two minutes. Otherwise, I will share now. No, it is. If it's happening, we will. Just... Yeah, it is. It is open. It is open. Okay. Okay. Shall I start? Uh, start good evening, Doctor Shashmit. I I uh, yes, I miss the pleasure of introducing you. Uh, I personally know Dr. Shushmita for about uh, almost 20 years now. Dr. Shushmita was uh, a, a fellow in uh, Minakshi, uh, in um, uh, A.B. Shetty uh, at the Clefton Craniofacial Center. And I think uh, she was the last uh, fellow uh, under Dr. Krishna Shabha Rao. I was in my final year uh, of my MDS when Dr. Shushmita joined. So I know her since then. And then uh, I would like to add that she... Uh, Last year, she organized a very fantastic um, uh, AMSI national conference in Indore, and I think uh, where she was the organizing uh, co-chairperson, and uh, it it was a really it was a scientific feast. Uh, it was a really well organized uh, conference, and my uh, commendations to you, Dr. Shashmita, for uh, uh, organizing that conference. And now I have the pleasure of uh, uh, moderating a session that uh, you are mentoring. So. Uh, Yes, we can start with our questions. And, yeah, uh, it is just uh, loading. One second, please. The she, uh, you can see the screen. Next slide. Yeah, yeah. Please go to the next slide. I think yeah. it's the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
the, the first question to you, Dr. Shushmita, is uh, one second. Is whether uh, a, a corticotomy or uh, osteotomy is uh, the preferred uh, technique for distraction? Thomas, actually, uh, the intention of making this PPT was more like uh, for a viva answers because the exams are coming up. So that was my intention. So we don't have much, uh, you know, we don't have diagrams explaining anything, but basically like a viva answers. So if a question on corticotomy and osteotomy is asked, uh, I think uh, as a postgraduate uh, at that level, you only know the difference between the two. Uh, the basic difference is uh, corticotomy, uh, you know, it involves dividing the bone only through its cortex with the preservation of the periosteal and the endosteal layers. Whereas uh, when you do an osteotomy, which mostly everybody would have observed, that it divides the bone through its entire width, including the periosteum and cortex and the endosteum. Now, uh, we should know that corticotomy, which is, you know, mostly practiced in um, the, definitely practiced in the pediatric patients because of all the uh, structures, important structures. Uh, the uh, advantage of this is it shows uh, uh, earlier, mineraliz earlier mineralization and uh, there is preservation of the uh, uh, intramedullary vessels and it is ben beneficial for bone regeneration. And uh, performing corticotomy is simple and definitely it's an effective way to promote the maturity of the distracted callus and the shorten the time for fixation. So, uh, Thomas, what is your uh, say? Anything to add? I, to I just have to say that uh, uh, usually uh, the initial cut is a corticotomy, and after fixing the distractor appliance, the osteotomy is completed through the medullary bone. The device is then activated to check for completion of the cuts and uh, mobilized. I just found an interesting article where uh, they have done an animal study. This is not a human, st human study where they found that the regenerate bone in the corticotomy, corticotomy uh, sides showed more bone formation and earlier mineralization than in the osteotomy side. I would like to add that this is an animal study mm -hmm. and they showed that the, the this study that was published in IJOM showed that uh, preservation of the intra, intra, intramedullary vessels is beneficial to bone regeneration following uh, distraction, and that uh, performing corticotomy may be a simple but effective way to promote the maturity of distracted callus. The, the, the number of studies show that osteotomy does not have any adverse effect on the final outcome. It is just that with corticotomy, it's, you get a faster bone regeneration, better remodeling. Uh, for but, but thing, but for all practical purposes, we we do do a do do a complete osteotomy to completely mobilize uh, the segments rather than have some sort of uh, uh, you know uh, adhering bone that may prevent distraction. So uh, in just in my, in uh, the my experience, we usually I we usually go for a complete osteotomy because we don't want any hindrance to the distraction process. Right. Uh, shall I go to the next question? This is the. Yes. How to prevent injuries to tooth buds when doing distraction of uh, osteogenesis for a patient with mixed dentition or primary dentition? Yes. So um, when uh, we consider uh, uh, this situation, it is uh, mostly encountered in the mandula distraction and of course in the maxilla as well, but the planes and the anatomy is so different that uh, the planning of the uh, osteotomy cut should be uh, planned according to that. So basically, when you are doing the um, mandible, you avoid the whole area of where the you can find the tooth buds. So basically, it doesn't need to be exactly perpendicular to the distraction vector, but it can be placed in such a way to avoid injury to the nerve and the developing dentition. So it is uh, basically you can have a 3D imaging virtual surgical planning and uh, this allows for the optimization of the osteotomy sites and you can place it posterior to the dentition when you consider the maxillary distraction you can avoid the uh, tooth buds by placing the osteotomy cuts above the level of the tooth buds which is just inferior to the infraorbital foramen and uh, yes uh, it is really uh, important that uh, the radiographic studies should be done to 
plan the feasibility and the placement of the devices. Uh, anything more to add? I, 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 I just I would like to add that you know if if at all uh, avoiding uh, uh, injury to tooth butt is a, is tooth butt is going to be a problem. You can always use a tooth bone distractor rather than a bone bone so that there is no uh, uh, there are no uh, uh, screws or uh, on uh, the bone. And if if at all you need the only thing is like Dr. Shishmeta said if you uh, for mandible you can use the uh, pins, you'll have to avoid somehow, uh, you'll have to put the pins in the lower border or something and uh, away from the intravenous nerve or lower border. But in the maxilla, you can always use a tooth bone distractor, you know, but it's always a very challenging um, uh, process to avoid uh, uh, injury to the tooth buds because most of the patients are in the mixed dentition period or pe young pediatric patients where you're in inevitably you're going to find tooth buds. Yes. So uh, good. Usually the excellent distractors, the pin distractors are used. Correct. Shall we go to the next question? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, how much to overcorrect in a pediatric case uh, requiring distraction of stenosis? So the overcorrection can be somewhere between ten to thirty percent, and uh, depending on the jaw that we are distracting and the area we are distracting. Uh, we have to account for the degree of relapse that, uh, you know, uh, that can happen and we need to do the overcorrection. And uh, the consolidation period also plays an important role. So, I guess this is, this is the percentage that we have to distract. Uh, I just uh, uh, was referring to this textbook, Sam Chukov. According to them, the amount of, you have to consider two factors. That is the amount of overcorrection must be added when mandibular lengthening is performed on the growing child, you have to overcorrect in a growing child because you have to factor in that. And this parameter is calculated based on the duration of remaining mandibular growth and the percentage of yearly growth deficiency. Uh, in this textbook, uh, Samchukov, they have uh, uh, shown this diagram here where the, uh, uh, they have shown uh, the, the way to calculate the amount of distraction is that you, you can draw a triangle uh, that shows the amount of distraction can be determined by simply drawing a triangle the, with the two, two sides of which represent the amount of corpus and the ramus shortening. And the angle between the two sides, uh, it, it represents the amount of uh, amount to be distracted. Uh, that amounts that that the third angle, the third side and is the amount of distraction. And that angle is the vector for uh, distraction. This is, I, I found uh, uh, this reference in this uh, textbook uh, craniofacial distraction oxygenesis by Sam Chukov. So this is what uh, is, uh, uh, you know, my, my opinion on this. Uh, anything to add, Shushmita? Shall we move to the next question? Uh, no, we'll move to the next question. Uh, the next question is uh, maxillary versus mandibular distraction. It's a very, uh, vague, very, uh, it's a vague question. A lot of, lot can be said. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Shishmita. Sorry to interrupt. Your uh, voice is very low. Volume is very low. Can you keep your mobile close to your uh, thing? Yes. Or you yes, can yes, use yes, earphone. Better. Yeah. Uh, better. Slightly better, but <laughs> slightly it can be better. Okay. Okay. Let me just pick up my earphone. Meanwhile, uh, we can discuss the next question. Uh, Shall I just uh, uh, tell? Uh, I just have, I just yeah. compiled a couple of things for, uh, if you look at mandibular versus uh, maxillary or mid-face distraction, see mandibular distractors can be both uh, external or uh, internal. Um, uh, ma maxillary distractors are mostly internal, mostly internal, but there are external distractors. Uh, ma mandibular distractors are always bone-bone, okay, whereas man uh, maxillary can be both bone-bone and tooth-bone. Mandibular distractors can be monoplanar or biplanar, depending on the vector. Um, maxillary distractors are mainly, uh, mainly monoplanar, but some RED devi devi devices are uh, biplanar. And the last difference is that uh, transport is most commonly done for mandibular reconstruction, mandibular uh, distraction. Tran uh, and the transport distraction is quite challenging and not commonly done for maxillary reconstruction. It has been done. But uh, because of the anterior curvature of the maxilla, it is quite challenging. You can't 
distract a short posterior part of the man, uh, maxilla with uh, transport, uh, but it's main, but very challenging for a curve, curvilinear aspect of the jaws, same with mandible. So it's mainly done for mandibular. This is just a basic, very uh, basic difference between mandibular and uh, maxillary distraction, uh, distractions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shishmita, would you like to uh, add? Actually, uh, actually, I think uh, probably this question should be, uh, should have been, uh, uh, like we can discuss it as the, uh, instead of maxillary versus mandibular. So I have just written the differences, like, uh, you know, where it comes into play and we have to be aware of things. So it's not the same, it's completely different because the uh, starting from the, you know, the way the bones are positioned. But I think uh, maxillary mandibular uh, distraction combined for the indications of hemifacial microsomia and sleep apnea and, you know, that uh, discussion would be better at this juncture, I feel. Uh, about your opinion on uh, indications where maxillary mandibular distraction is done together. What are the indications and how the vector uh, changes and what is the kind of osteotomy that we have to do for uh, uh, maxilla. So I think uh, we uh, the we can refer to a few articles. Uh, I will send across the articles where uh, uh, the uh, combined maxillary mandibular distraction indications and uh, the uh, 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 yes. So uh, that is that should be discussed rather than I think versus. Oh, uh, yeah, I, yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. It is because you see the distraction, there are so many overlapping features. The concept of distraction is the same. The concept is the same, whether it's maxilla or mandible. Yes. It is just the devices that are different, techniques that are different. So I just, there are a lot of overlap, uh, overlapping uh, uh, areas between both mandibular and maxillary distraction. You cannot really say versus, like you correctly said, there is no versus. It's the, it yes. is, you know, it is, it should be mandibular or uh, maxillary in that, you know, it would be more or appropriate. Combined. Uh, combined, yeah, because there are so many overlapping features. And it is just that um, uh, nothing can be said it's exclusively for mandible or exclusively for maxilla. It's only from uh, from an anatomical point of view that uh, the distractors that are used for mandible or maxilla can be a little different, but the concept, the principles, biological basis, everything is the uh, same. I just put a few broad outline outlines in differences, uh, you know, uh, just to show the, uh, the difference between these two. Uh, but like you said, it's it is you know it is a uh, it is uh, a question where it uh, should be more uh, the indications for mandible or maxilla. Shall we move to the next question, uh, Dr. Yes. Shishmita? Yes. Uh, various type of distractors and the indications. Yeah, I guess uh, this is a very uh, direct question, and you have uh, different uh, kind of classifications, uh, basically in different textbooks and articles. But uh, on a broader basis, uh, it is very simple. It can be classified as internal distractors and external distractors. And these both of them can be uni, bi, or multidirectional. And when you come to internal, you have tooth bone or uh, bone bone uh, um, distractors or the hybrid ones. And uh, in external distractors, mostly all are only, uh, you know, it is only the uh, bone, uh, bone distractors. And then in intraoral, you have submucosal, extramucosal, subcutaneous. But then again, we can come to a different classification as well. Whether it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether it is, yes. So, uh, according to the uh, direction of the distractor, it can be uh, whether it is, a uni vector, bi vector, or a multi vector. So, yes, uh, any more uh, classifications? Uh, uh, no, Dr. Shishmita, you have uh, you have classified it correct. Uh, you know, you have the the, the standard classification. Uh, like you said, uh, the 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 classification is in relation with the skin surface, uh, external or internal. Uh, actually, this is rather than extra oral or intra oral. This is a more apt or appropriate term to use: external or internal, whether it's a uh, uh, buried or if it is completely weathered, it all depends where your distractor arm is. The distractor, the actual activating arm is within 
the submucosal or subcutaneous tissue or extraoral, the actual uh, distractor activate, uh, activator. If that is uh, subcut mucosal or subcutaneous, it and uh, again, it can come out through the oral cavity or it can come out uh, through transcutaneously. So it is more uh, internal or external. That is the actual act, the, the, the distractor arm. Then you have uh, in relation with the bone, whether uh, introscious or extroscious. This actually is only used for, uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, alveolar distractors called uh, a lead distractor, which is not commonly used, where the distractor device is actually within the bone rather than on the surface of the bone. So it's a, uh, it's a very, uh, it's, you don't see it very often. It is within the bone itself, the actual distractor arm, distractor device. And then uh, you have uh, whether the distractor actual the distraction is tooth bone or bone bone, like you said, or they can be hybrid devices. Again, depending upon the vector, it can be mono vector or monoplanar and multi vector or multi planar. Then, according to the type of reconstruction, this is mainly used for uh, transport distraction. It can be monofocal, bifocal, or trifocal. It's I have some pictures. I have just compiled. It would be easier for uh, the postgraduates to understand the different uh, types on the pictures I will explain to you. So, and I finally, according to the site of distraction on the mandible, it can be ramus, body, condyle, symphysis, alveolus, mid-face, according to the various areas, your, your lipho one, two, three distraction, fronto-orbital or a monoblock, that's called a fronto-facial, alveolus uh, and maxillary anterior or posterior segmental, zygomatic calvarial. I will just show you a few, few pictures, then all this classification will become very easy. The picture on the left is a, 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 the, the body distraction. It's, a, it's an internal distractor mandible. On the picture on the right is an external distractor. You can see that the actual di the, the distractor mechanism, the, the screw and the rod is within the mucosa and the subcutaneous tissue in the first case, whereas in the second case, it is outside. So that is the main difference where your distracting distractor uh, activator is out external or internal. Again, this is, uh, you can see this is a condylar kind of distraction, uh, internal distraction uh, distractor. That is again, a, a body distractor, again, internal distractor for the mandible. The first one is for condylar reconstruction. This again is a, a ramus distractor. And Dr. Shushmita was discussing earlier about maxillomandibular distraction used for uh, craniofacial microsomia. So this is where uh, that Molina's technique is used, where you, you put, the, we have a facial asymmetry with a cant, upward cant. You put the jaws in IMF and you start distracting the ramus. It will bring the cant, it will create the, it will correct the asymmetry and the, the midline and also the cramp correction. This is uh, the tech, the Molina and Monasterio's technique of uh, maxillum and blood distraction, uh, where you use a, it, you can either use an internal distractor or in this case, you can see an external distractor. You can see it is used for hemifacial microsomia for cant correction and asymmetry correction. This is a, a, a newer distractor where uh, heavy facial microsomia is correct. The la there is lateral distraction uh, happening. It's a, it's a, where you can see the osteotomy cut is very similar to a SAG. But instead of an anteroposterior or superior inferior distraction, here, here it is a mediolateral distraction. This is a lateral distraction. Uh, not, it's, uh, it is used for the flattening that you see with uh, hemifacial microsomia. Uh, again, you have midline distractors for the mandible. You have alveolar distractors for the mandible. Again, these are all internal distractors. Now, this is a trans example of transport distraction where you can see a transport segment that has been, the first picture shows transport segment is being distracted from anterior to posterior. In the second, it has been distracted from posterior to anterior. So this is a, uh, this is a, a bifocal type of distraction uh, where uh, you reconstruct the, rather than lengthening of the elongation of the bone, you're actually reconstructing or lengthening of the bone. This is called a, 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 a transport distraction. Uh, see, this picture shows that the first is an example of uh, a bifocal distraction, uh, where you can see there are two focus of bone uh, formation. One is between the osteotomized segment and one is on the, the leading edge of the transport segment. Uh, all your uh, 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 distraction where you, you do distract for, a, say, ramus lengthening is a monofocal. There is only one focus of bone formation between the two osteotomized segment. All transport is bifocal. That is, there, is, there are two foci of bone formation. One is between the osteotomized segments, and the second focus is in the, uh, the, the, the leading segment. The second is an example of trifocal. There, there are, you can see there are three focus of bone formation between the two uh, 
the between the two bone segments between the two transport segments and the uh, respective osteotomized segment and the, the third picture is an example of a quadrifocal or tetrafocal where there are four foci of bone uh, formation and four uh, the three focuses of bone formation and one focus where there are, there are the two leading segments they approximate each other so these are all basic concepts of distraction uh, now coming to mid phase distraction these are again uh, internal distractors for the mid phase where a lipoosteotomy is done this is again here is an example of a, a biplanar distraction for mid phase not commonly done where you can adjust the vector you can see in the first picture you can the the one end is fixed to the zygoma whereas the second end is fixed to the uh, the, the teeth and you can see a screw where you can adjust the angle of the screw and adjust the vector so this is an internal um, a biplanar maxillary distractor the second is your commonly known uh, com commonly uh, uh, no known distractor called RED or rigid external distractor. Here again, it is an external device. The distractor device is external. Only the uh, the, the pins are, or the bone plates are anchored to the osteotomized segments. And you can actually adjust the, the vector in this case. You can bring the maxilla forward as well as downward. So this is uh, all these pictures I'm showing you to show you, tell you different con uh, concepts about distraction, about uh, biplanar, monoplanar, internal, external. This is again, you can see alveolar distraction in, in the first picture that is mainly done for cleft alveolus. Second is actually um, a, a bone bone, a rapid palatally, a rap, rapid palatal uh, distraction where you can see a midline osteotomy has been done. And here a, a bone bone device is used to uh, increase the transverse width of the maxilla. The same thing can be done using a, like a, like a hyrax appliance using a tooth bone uh, appliance where Osteotomy is the same, only thing the distractor appliance is anchored to the tooth, that would be tooth bone. And if you rotate this 90 degrees, you can, you can if you rotate this hyrax appliance 90 degrees, you can actually do anterior maxillary distraction, where you can do a uh, anterior maxillary oste a segmental osteotomy and you can distract the anterior maxilla. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that. These are examples of cranio cranial craniofacial distractors, where the first is an internal uh, uh, lipo a three distraction, lipo three distraction. The second is, is a picture of uh, a posterior uh, calvarial distraction, posterior calvarial distraction. These are all examples where it's, you do it for syndromic cases, syndromic uh, uh, craniosynosis, craniosynosis or non-syndromic craniosynostosis. This is an example again of our, you can see the first is an internal distractor that is being used to distract at a, a, a lipo three level. The second is the same lipo three distraction, but using an external distractor. You, again, you can see the RED device. You can do either a, a distraction of a lipo osteo one osteotomy or a lipo three osteotomy. But the distractor device is same. It's external. Only thing the osteotomy cuts and the level of osteotomy with, will help you uh, correct the deformity. So choosing distracted all depends upon, of course, the diagnosis and the the, uh, the the defect, whether it's just a maxillary or a craniofacial, and in this case, uh, again, you can see it is a, 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 a it is a monoblock destruction. Monoblock means where of the frontal bone as well as the uh, lifot three osteotomy is taken together. This is uh, probably you can this is done for a Cruzon syndrome where the entire uh, monoblock frontal uh, facial the uh, uh, frontal on the and the uh, uh, facial bone is distracted together using an internal device. And just to, uh, the second part of the question had some of the indications for mandibular and manticular distraction. See, mandibular distraction is commonly done for all kinds of congenital mandibular uh, hypoplasia, syndromic cases, craniofacial microsomia, uh, Pierre Robin syndrome, Tretcher Collins, Golden Heart, uh, uh, Nager syndrome, Mobius syndrome. Uh, and of course, uh, that is congenital for acquired, most commonly done for TMG ankylosis to correct mandibular def deficiency. Also, uh, obstructive sleep apnea that you get in uh, TMJ ankylosis, reconstruction of ablative or traumatic mandibular defects, alveolar uh, deficiency, transverse discrepancy of maxilla uh, of, of, the, of the mandible. Uh, I, all this I have shown you in this, with the various distractors that have been shown, and these are some of the indications for that. For mid phase distraction, it's mainly, mainly used for maxillary hypoplasia and secondary cleft deformity, syndromic craniosynostosis or craniofacial uh, dissociosis like. Uh, Cruzons, Aperts, Pfeiffer syndrome, non-syndromic craniosynostosis, reconstruction of the calvular de defect with transport segment, alveolar destruction can be done, 
parallel uh, expansion, <clears throat> again, alveolar vertical or horizontal augmentation for where you can do it for cleft alveolars, as well as for implant placement. And recurs again, transport distraction, secondary to tumor resection, and then also for OSA. These are the indications, and all those pictures of distractors that I showed can be employed for each of these um, uh, various diagnoses. Uh, Dr. Shishmita, uh, yes. go to the next question. Uh, yes, vector planning and distraction osteogenesis is a huge topic in itself. So uh, just to uh, you know, uh, briefly introduce this whole concept, basically the distraction vector is defined as the desired direction of the distal segment in which it should be moving during the lengthening. And uh, the factors uh, that affect the vectors of distraction are the osteotomy design, the location of the uh, uh, segment or the osteotomy where from where we have to distract, the distraction device orientation, and uh, later even the masticatory muscles during the distraction influence the way we are going ahead. Then in case there is an occlusal interference and uh, there is some uh, technical problem with the distraction, all these affect the distraction vector. And uh, it should be kept in mind that it should al always be parallel to the uh, desired uh, direction. And uh, the most uh, common um, uh, thing to be noted is uh, when uh, we are doing the distraction of the mandible without controlling the vector, it can cause asymmetry or a, a clockwise rotation of the mandible resulting in an open bite. So basically, uh, when we are uh, using the extraoral devices, there are uh, you know, uh, the devices, it is, they assist in controlling of the vector. Plus, you have uh, something called the uh, temporary uh, uh, devices, which uh, actually help you to uh, control and uh, the tooth attachments and uh, temporary, um, uh, the temporary, the device, which is, uh, you know, elastics and uh, uh, are used to actually control and, uh, you know, the anchorage devices which are used to actually hold it in uh, the particular direction and guide the distractor uh, to go ahead. And uh, there are some uh, formulas to actually, uh, which I have not included in the PPT. Uh, there are some formulas which uh, are given in the article, one of the articles which we have mentioned. Uh, you can calculate the vector uh, direction uh, based on that. Uh, uh, can I just add a couple of things, say, Dr. Shukrita? Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. I have just put some picture uh, diagrams also just to uh, explain this because vector planning. This is quite. Uh, this is actually a very interesting topic in uh, distraction. It's a very important. It's a very important concept that we should know. Uh, the most important thing to know is it is not the osteotomy cut, but the orientation of the distracted device that uh, determines vector. It's very very important. Uh, we, most people. Uh, most people think it is is the direction of the osteotomy cut. It is not the direction of osteotomy cut that determines vector, rather than the placement or the orientation of the distracted device. So, if only unilateral ramus is lengthening is required, the distractor is positioned parallel to the uh, ramus of the mandible. If only unilateral lengthening of the corpus is required, the distractor is placed parallel to the corpus of the mandible. In cases where with simultaneous ramus and corpus lengthening. The distract, distractor may be placed according to a, a very simple formula. This is again, it is uh, taken from uh, uh, Samchukov. Uh, there are a couple of uh, 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 seminal books on distraction. One is Samchukov, um, another one is Bell and Guerrero, and the third one is McCarthy. They all these are all exclusive books on distraction. Here you can you can calculate the the pin placement angle. Uh, it's where it is given as 180 minus gonial angle into the ramus by total deficiency, whereas the, the pin placement angle equals the angle between the distraction vector and the, the mandibular plane. You can see that in the, the corticotomy is done here. And these are the, this is the angulation of the uh, distractor device. So that the, the, the angle is the angle between distractor vector and the mandibular plane. And this is the formula given by uh, Sam Chukov. It's a little complicated, but to and make it very simple, I'll just show you a couple of pictures. This again, uh, some very interesting article uh, the, given by Grayson, uh, who is actually the, or the, or the you know, who designed the uh, uh, distraction along with McCarthy. And it, it uh, so 
if you there are various variations in the morphology of the posterior border so uh, if the uh, if there are variations in the morphology of the posterior border of the ramus or the lower border of the uh, mandible then the device is placed perpendicular to the occlusal uh, plane in the ramus or parallel to the occlusal plane in the in the body so if uh, if there are some sort of uh, morphological uh, differences in the ramus or lower border then you place the device perpendicular that is that gives you the orient some sort of orientation perpendicular to the occlusal plane or uh, parallel to the uh, occlusal plane if you want so you can either keep it perpendicular to the occlusal plane in the first picture or you can keep it parallel to occlusal plane as you can see in the second picture then uh, if there are significant ab abnormalities in the occlusal plane then the device is placed parallel to the lower border of the uh, lower border of the mandible so in if you are these are the various vectors of distraction this again this is uh, this is from uh, uh, the textbook of distraction by mccarthy so the distraction can be related to the maxillary that here he has given the uh, the reference point as the maxillary occlusal plane it can either be horizontal it can be vertical or it can be oblique see one of the ways is that if you are uh, distracting if you are keeping the distracted device perpendicular to the uh, maxillary occlusal plane what is going to happen is there is going to be a uh, there is going to be a, a vertical elongation of the uh, vertical uh, elongation of the mandible and then uh, there's going to be open bite you can do callus molding you can the soft callus that you can use uh, that you find you can use elastics to bring the uh, mandible forward so by by distracting by uh, keeping the distractor per, per, uh, perpendicular to the occlusal plane you get an advancement of the chin you can see in this picture you can there's a counterclockwise rotation which dr shushmita mentioned you can actually bring the chin uh, downward and forward by uh, some callus molding but there will be a posterior open bite so uh, this is where this happens when you're keeping the distracted device uh, 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 perpendicular to the maxillary occlusal plane so uh, so if with an oblique vector in the mandible distraction the chin point is translated in an inferior direction without closing of the anterior open bite but with a vertical vector there is a counterclockwise rotation of the mandible you can actually bring the uh, chin forward and upwards whereas you can just um, if with uh, you can just bring the chin downwards if you are using a, a, a oblique vector whereas you can bring the chin downwards and forwards if you are using a vertical vector so this is a very simple uh, 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 a formula to de design to decide uh, planning distraction planning of distraction vector for what like i told you earlier for vertical lengthening of the ramus you place the device perpendicular to the uh, occlusal plane for vertical lengthening of the ramus for horizontal lengthening of the corpus you place the device parallel to the uh, occlusal plane uh, or you can keep it even parallel to the lower border of the mandible in if you keep it parallel to the lower border of the mandible there will be a, a slight anterior open bite and for simultaneous lengthening of the corpus and the uh, ramus most of ankylosis cases you need both ramus and corpus lengthening because uh, there is a complete foreshortening of body and the ramus so you you that is where we ideally use biplanar or bi uh, biplanar distractors for uh, lengthening of corpus and ramus so if you don't if you're using a uniplanar distractor then the vector is calculated by you you place the device perpendicular to the line bisecting the uh, ramus and the lower border of the uh, mandible so that uh, a line bisecting the lower uh, posterior border of ramus and the lower border of ramus a line bisecting that you keep the this device obliquely to it i mean obliquely so that it is perpendicular to the bisecting line so this will uh, lead to both ramus as well as corpus lengthening so these are some concepts on uh, vector planning which is actually little complicated and uh, th these are some of the books where the pgs can refer samchukov mccarthy and they can get the concepts um, sorted out how to decide the vector planning uh Dr. Shishmita, the next question is on yeah, uh, complications question, uh, of distraction, oxygenesis. Yes. Um, so, complications can be very simply divided into interoperative, then uh, during the distraction, uh, that is uh, intradistraction and post distraction. Uh, 
and uh, during the intraoperative you can encounter incomplete bone fracture as uh, he mentioned mostly everything is osteotomy corticotomy is just a way of doing it but eventually you have to separate it completely then you have the nerve damage problem with the device that is instability breakage and uh, because of this uh, it is always uh, advised that you first place the distractor and then complete the cut not completely do the osteotomy and then try to place a distractor so that is a part of the planning so generic uh, then you have uh, regular other uh, complications as uh, bleeding uh, swell bleeding during the procedures then uh, damage to the developing tooth buds which we discussed how to avoid then uh, during the distraction uh, you can have a uh, technical problem to activate the distractor uh, distractor then later if there is premature mature calcification of the bone then uh, then patient is uh, you know compliance is very bad or uh, he's not able to tolerate the uh, um, hardware then you have breakage sometimes and instability Inf infection can be encountered uh, then it can be you know teeth or uh, there can be uh, damage to the teeth as well uh, if you are having extra anchorages then uh, post distraction you can have malignant failure of the callus to uh, heal during the consolidation period then of course relapse which is why we discussed about uh, over uh, correcting the uh, just, uh, uh, you know um, percentage of uh, uh, distraction that we should be doing extra to prevent the relapse then uh, the <clears throat> nerve damage uh, the the time that is taken for the nerve damage to recover if it happens then of course facial uh, scarring is something which uh, differs from patient to patient and then of course some minor discrepancies of speech as well can be noted and uh, uh, it is uh, during distraction this complication can also be divided uh, like uh, premature callus that is regenerative malformations it can be uh, cited then axial deviations soft tissue overstretching and of course uh, infections so uh, this is in brief the complications that can be encountered anything more uh, um, uh, dr shushmita i think this is a very a very uh, a very simple and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, simple classification where you have intraoperative intra distraction post distraction and i think this is very comprehensive all pg should uh, take a screenshot of this because it is it gives um, uh, 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 gives all the complications uh, divided into three three stages i just put uh, Uh, just for for uh, very uh, simple uh, you know complications one is the pin track uh, scarring uh, loss of better you know with it, the, the the pin track scarring occurs of course only with external pin distractors or if you have any when the distractor rod is coming out through the skin transcutaneously loss of vector control where you know your planning uh, probably was not adequate and then the whole dist distractor goes uh, haywire uh, you know you you the, the vector of distraction goes wrong of course infection of the distracted device because as as happens with any hardware the distract remember distracted device especially um, especially transport distractors are left in situ for about 3 to 4 months during the consolidation period so during the long that long and you have a distractor uh, distractor arms or distractor ports coming out transcutaneously so there's always a high risk of infection retrograde infection from the a uh, transcutaneous spins or the ports uh, uh, migrating uh, uh, retrograde into the into the bone and into the uh, distracted callus so there's always high risk of infection with the hardware uh, because these are uh, you know uh, these are not completely uh, sealed devices there is always something sticking out uh, uh, the distractor arm is sticking out so there's always risk of infection and last is device malfunction for some reason like dr shushmita said if a, a distraction stops there's early consolidation or some bone interference or there is uh, some cons consolidation usually consolidation will happen uh, along curvatures along uh, curvilinear areas you know or or there is some interference on either cortices or if your if, if your uh, 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 corticotomy or your osteotomy is not complete one side is uh, holding uh, or um, uh, some bone interferences then you know the distraction distraction will stop prematurely you know you will not distract it will suddenly it won't distract anymore it will stop distracting and then the bo it it will uh, it will be suboptimal and will start consolidating that is like a premature uh, the, the distraction would fail you will not achieve the, uh, the uh, intended planned uh, 
the lengthening. So that would be a, a device a malfunction, you know, where uh, there is early consolidation. So uh, rest pretty much, I think Dr. Shushmita has very elaborately uh, uh, explained, you know. Um, uh, anything else uh, on the complications, Dr. Shushmita? Uh, no, no, I think you are more elaborate. So no, I no, 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 no. I just, I just kept it uh, Okay, very simple, you know. Yeah, yeah, complication. And the, the like, last basically it was also called as you know technical complication and biological complication, and you know you can classify it based on you know the understanding as well. So yeah, the last is a contraindication of distraction, which I feel is uh, again quite generic for most of the surgical procedures that we um, have discussed. I know you know when they implants also like insufficient quantity or quality of bone which will inhibit the fixation, you know, uh, then you have inability to comply with the regime. Somebody with allergies, metal allergies, pure immunological conditions, then of course, anybody with any kind of neuro or psychotic disorders are not a uh, candidates for uh, uh, distraction. And then any kind of uh, compromised medical condition, then, of course, in irradiated uh, bones, of course, which affect the bone metabolism or any kind of medication that the patient is on, which is affecting their bone metabolism. And uh, then, especially in very young children, you know, compliance is always a problem. And uh, that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, anything more that you're adding? This? Yeah, actually, I just have, uh, there is only, in my opinion, only one absolute contraindication that is an uh, uncooperative patient and uncooperative patient family. You see, uh, th this, uh, 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 most of them were like, of course, what you have mentioned are contraindications, but I would say they are more relative because as, as with any hardware implantation, whether it's for bone reconstruction or fracture, uh, you know, things like uh, allergy and uh, bone metabolism is kind of common to everything, you know, systemic conditions yes. of the patient. But this, what is unique in distraction is the long period of time that the distractor is placed uh, in situ with the patient and the patient's cooperation and compliance. For months on, they have to be... Uh, the, and, 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 you know, it is not easy to understand, but most of these distractors are placed in very young children, cranio patients with uh, craniofacial uh, uh, syndromes and uh, mandib mandibular deficiencies are very young children, expecting them to wear a, 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 a hardware with some rod sticking out and, you know, or some sort of a halo frame on their head, walking around, going to school. It is, a, it is an understatement to, to expect them to be cooperative, you know. So patient compliance is most important. If a patient is compliant, and family supports and uh, helps with the, the 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 very strict regimen and the distraction protocol not not failing at all to do the distraction activation as uh, uh, recommended then i think uh, you can overcome any other uh, contraindication you know so i think this is the only most important factor the absolute contraindication is patient compliance because they have to wear this thing around for months and endure all the complications and challenges and social uh, stigma and uh, you know peer pressure uh, also when they go around wearing these appliances you know so if you can overcome this i think pretty much all others are relative uh, contraindications you know so that is what i feel dr shishmita okay uh, yes i guess we have uh, gone through the questions yes i think yeah 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 dr shashikala i think we have completed uh... okay thank you sir thank you thank you ma'am Okay. With this, we come to the end of the session. On behalf of Tamil Nadu Able MSI, we would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the mentor, Dr. Shushmita, and moderator, Dr. Thomas, for the significant and invaluable contribution and sharing their extensive knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Shushmita and Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shushmita. Thank you very much, Dr. Shashikala. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tamil Nadu MSI for giving uh, me the opportunity to uh, take part in this uh, uh, ask a mentor session. I thank you very much, Dr. Shushmita. It, uh, it, is, it, is, a, it is a pleasure to interact with you uh, on a scientific forum uh, for the first time, actually. 